Uh, hi everyone, I'm Laura from Water Rangers. I'm the Community and Operations Manager, as it says on there. And so Water Rangers' mission, you've heard a little bit about us, but it's really to help equip communities and groups, just like your school, to have equipment and the knowledge they need to be able to go out and test the water quality and share that data online. Um, so Jonathan did a really good job of showing different data platforms on there. Uh, water Rangers has one of their own. Um, I can show it to you later um, if you want, I think right now. Yeah, it's similar to what you were seeing on data stream, but a little bit more um, easy to use. And we really like to be able to, um, to show people over time changes in the water and the different things they measure. So this is Lake Miglashan, which is where the headquarters of Water Rangers is, and it's been monitored for years. Um, so you can see here there's data dating all the way back to 2003 for this water body. And it gives you an idea of how um, these different parameters change over time. You get these nice little graphs. And you can also download the data for any location since it is open source, so anyone can have access to it um, to give you to do any types of reports that you might want with uh, this data. So uh, let me stop sharing my screen. So today I'm going to walk you quickly through uh, the education kit, which you'll get to use um, in a bit. I'll ask you some questions, which you'll just be able to raise your hand to answer, um, just to get a sense of, of some knowledge in the room later on. So I just wanted to be able to see you. Thanks. So in here, if you ever have any questions about anything while you're on the field, you'll want to refer to your um, your guide that's in there. Mine's in French, you have an English one, um, but it has a lot of information about what's normal values for different parameters you might find in there. Um, so as you're doing all these tests, if you wanna know if a value is normal or not, and you're not too sure, you can refer to that. Um, when you get to your testing location, the first thing you'll wanna do is take your air thermometer. So it's this thing, uh, you might not have this little loop on it, uh, but you'll want to hang it in the shade. Um, so usually we say a tree is a good spot to hang it. You can use the temperature that you find on your phone on like a weather app, but it might not be as precise because the stations that take the weather uh, on your phone might be located further away from where you are. So it's good to take the temperature right where you're testing. So you'd hang it in a shaded tree, or if you don't have access to a shaded tree, then just hold it um, in the shade, even if it's just the shade of your body, for a few minutes over, um, over the ground. So the next thing you'll want to reach for is this little contraption, which some of you might recognize. It's actually a selfie stick, but we've rebranded it um, as what we call a reacher stick. So it does pull out um, so that you can easily take some water samples without getting all wet. Um, so you'll have these little sample cups and to put it in the clamp, you just go like this and you can tighten the little knob to make sure it's very secure. Um, and then you'll be ready to go take your sample. So when you take your water sample, you're going to want to go at a depth of at least 15 centimeters below the surface. And you're gonna wanna rinse your cup three times. Um, so you want to go at least 15 centimeters because that top layer of the water is going to have a bit of different uh, properties than what's deeper. So there's going to be more mixing. Um, it's going to be a little bit warmer. So you want to go deeper because it's more representative of the water body. And you're going to want to rinse it three times because I don't know if you can see, but my cup's quite dirty. So there's some residue from some previous tests that I did. Um, but also if I was outside and it was sunny, I might have sunscreen on my hands or something and I'm handling this. So I'd want to remove any residue and make sure that it's really clean um, before I take my sample. So rinse three times, take your water sample, which is going to have a little water. I'm unfortunately not close to a water body, so I just have some tap water here today to do these little experiments um, with you. So I'm just going to pour a little bit of water in here, show you how to use everything. You don't need your cup to be really full. I'm just going to spill if you overfill it. The first tool you're going to want to use is this contraption, which uh, is called a conductivity meter. And conductivity is a measure of water's ability to conduct electricity. And how it measures that is that there's these two little electrodes. They look like little screws here. And the conductivity meter is going to send a tiny little electrical current from one to the other 
and it's going to measure how quickly it travels from one to the next. Um, this current can't harm you. It's like very, very small current. It can't harm fish or anything. Um, and the measurement is going to be taken in what we call micro siemens per centimeter. Um, so you'll see that in the little notepads that you have that you'll be given to take the notes, like Jonathan said, and uh, your teacher as well. You're going to have these little notepads to take all the results, and then they can be put online um, after if you uh, don't use the app right away in the field. So to turn this on, just press the top button. You'll see it flashing, and then you'll see on top US, which is micro siemens. Um, and then you'll see at the bottom another number. So that's going to be your uh, water temperature. So this is going to give you conductivity, but uh, water temperature as well. So to do this super easy, you just dunk it in like this and you'll wait for the numbers to stabilize. Uh, you can swoosh it around a little bit um, just to make sure there's no air bubbles on the, the little um, screws at the bottom. It's going to help the value stabilize. So I get about 277 and my temperature here is 21.4. So I would write that down. Um, so you might be wondering what these values mean. All right, I was just going to say this morning, our values were around 600. For Ooh, 600. So quite a bit higher than what I get over here. So mm -hmm. uh, it'd be interesting to see what your riverbeds are made of or where your water comes from. Um, 600 is not a number that's alarming. So usually under 1500 is completely safe for human consumption. Um, so at 600, you're still fine. And um, I was going to say that conductivity, like a lot of things that we're measuring, is one of these things that you have to go and measure often to see what's normal for your water body. Um, I like to think of water bodies almost like, like people, right? We're all a little bit different. We all have good days. We all have bad days. Um, but we usually have a normal, um, so a normal good day. <laughs> and so you have to go and get to know them and go often to figure out what their normal is, because um, you might catch them on a day that's a little bit off. Um, so it's important to go back often and note those results. So as long as the results that you get are within kind of normal, accepted, safe values, um, then it's totally fine. So at 600, you're within a normal level. And if that's what you usually get when you test, then that's fine for that water body. Um, it might be due to different things in the water that cause a high conductivity. A lot of the times it's different sediments and salts that might be naturally occurring in uh, the water. So I'm just gonna dry this and to close it, I just press the button on top. If you press some buttons and it goes into a strange mode, um, just unscrew the cap, take out a battery and put it back in and I'll reset the conductivity meter. And next thing we'll be testing, uh, we'll be using these little test strips that are in this container. Um, so these are pool test strips. You might be familiar with this type of test strip. You might have used them um, before for an aquarium or for pool at home. Um, so we're going to test for chlorine. So this is just like the type of chlorine you put in a pool. Uh, it's not naturally occurring in natural water bodies, but it could be there if some people are emptying their pool in a stream that they shouldn't be emptying it in. Uh, or if you're close to a water treatment plant and your water treatment plant uses chlorine to disinfect water. Then we have pH, alkalinity, and hardness. A pH you might have heard of, it's a measure of how acid or how basic the water is, um, with seven being neutral. Um, so usually you want your water to be around that seven mark, so between six and eight is quite normal. Alkalinity is, um, is I, li I like to think of it as like a shield, um, so it protects against changes in pH. So if you have a high alkalinity, it doesn't mean anything bad. It just means that this water body is actually what we call resilient. So it's not going to change pH very easily, which is good because it means that it creates a more stable environment for the aquatic ecosystem. And hardness is the last one on here. You may have heard of hardness. Um, does anyone at home, do they know if they get the water from a well or an underwater source? If you do, you can just raise your hand. Your hand? Well. Yeah, I see a couple people. Okay, so you may be aware of this. Your under water, um, ooh, underground water source may have what we call hard water. It's very common for well water um, because it's surrounded by all of these sediments and they slowly leach into the water. 
and they increase um, what we call a hardness just because there's lots of salts in there. Um, and it's oftentimes not very dangerous. It's just not very good for plumbing. It's gonna make the pipes go rusty and it can have a little bit of a salty taste. So we'll often remove a lot of these minerals with a water softener to make it more comfortable for us. Um, so uh, hardness is just one of these parameters that you have to measure and um, see what's normal in your water body. Um, and hardness usually doesn't change too much over time when you go measure it uh, every time. So to do this, super simple, with dry hands, you take out a little test strip. I'm going to take my same water sample, dip it in there for two seconds, one, two. Then you'd wait 20 seconds to take your measurement, but I'll just show you how to do it right away. I'm going to do it with pH, which is the second one. You want to always start by putting your test strip, aligning it vertically with whatever parameter you're measuring, and then slowly moving it on the color scale until you find the color that matches. So I'm right around, I'm gonna turn it around. I'm right around 7.5 actually right now for me. So I would note that down. Since this is a color test, um, we recommend that you do it with a friend because we all see colors a little bit differently. Um, so you might wanna agree with your friend on a color you see. And if you don't see the same color, that's totally fine. Just take the average between the two values. Uh, and you can also always write the average between two values on here that you see. So if you see something between 6.8 and 7.2, you would write down a seven as your value. So once you're done with this, um, there's a little garbage in the kit, you can just put it in there. The next test I'm gonna show you is my favorite. It's a little trickier, but it's a lot of fun. It's uh, dissolved oxygen and it comes in a little kit like this. So you're going to want to remove the scale on top. So you just pull from the top. Might be a little rough if you have a newer kit. And for this one in the little box, you're going to want to take out one of these little glass vials. So you do have to be quite careful when you do this because you are going to be um, playing with glass essentially. So I take out one of these. There's a little bit of a reagent in here. It's called indigo blue. Um, and at the top here, you can see that there's a little white line. And that's a weak point in the glass. So we're going to have to break that. And to be able to break that, what we're going to do is use this other sample cup. It's a little bit different. Um, it has these little grooves at the bottom. So uh, I will show you with water in a second, but I'm just going to show you the motion right now. You're going to want to put the tip on the side in one of these grooves. And then I usually like to just pinch the ampoule against the uh, wall here and then it will break the tip. It's not a downward motion, it's really a sideways lever motion to break the tip and it really shouldn't require very much strength at all. Um, so this test is a little bit complicated because you have to do it very quickly. So usually the whole thing should take you less than 30 seconds. This fits nicely in my reacher stick. So to take a sample would be the same process as I did before. So I want a new sample here because as soon as I took out my other sample here, it started mixing with the oxygen in the air. So if, if I were to test it, which I will do, um, I'm gonna get a pretty high dissolved oxygen content just because it's been mixing for so long. So it wouldn't be representative. So I would put this in here, rinse my cup three times, then take my sample. I will just use to show you the same water sample. And I'm gonna put it in here. And if we're all silent, we might hear a little whoosh sound. So if everyone's quiet, wait for it. So I broke the tip and with a vacuum effect, all of the uh, water went in and it's already starting to change colors. You can see to ensure good mixing, I'm just gonna tip it up and down twice to make sure that little bubble goes up and down twice fully. And before we take our measurement, we have to wait a full two minutes. So there's a little timer in here. You can use that or you can use your phone to make sure you wait two minutes, whatever works for you. Um, I'm just going to take my measurement right away to show you. This is once again a color test. You want to be doing it with a friend. And if you see different colors, then you can um, just take the average between the two. So this is my scale, it goes from one to 12 and any value over seven is considered very good for any cold water fish. 
Um, so that's probably a value that you'd want to hit at least is at least seven because it means that it can support uh, all sorts of cold water fish where you are. So I would, we always say to start from the bottom, even if you know that it's going to be much darker, just so you don't miss any steps. So I'm probably around here. I'm going to turn around to better see. So I read about an eight right now. I did not wait my full two minutes and my water is a little bit oxygenated, um, but usually when I go test the water body that's close to me, which is quite urban, but I know there's fish there, um, I usually get a value around 10, uh, which is pretty good for, for an urban uh, stream. So once you're done with this, you can also throw um, the pool in the little garbage and just pack everything up. Now, the last test you guys have is not one that I have, but I have something similar. It's the Secchi Disc tube to measure water clarity. Hopefully you're seeing what yours looks like. Um, it's going to be a little bit different. Mine is this big disc like this, and this tool has actually been used for um, about 200 years as is. Uh, it's very easy to use, and it's going to give us a measure of water clarity, so how clear the water is. And that's going to change over time. So in the spring, when there's lots of water mixing, uh, it's going to look much different um, than in, in the middle of summer when things are a little bit more quiet. So to do this, if you were using this one, you would just let it fall slowly into the water until you can't see the disc at all anymore. And then you would take the measurement right at the top of the water body. Um, so it really depends on where you are. I've done this in Lake Erie, and I've gotten measures of 0.6 meters. And I've done this in Lake McGloshan, where I showed you some data on the app before, and I get measures of 8 meters. Um, so it really depends on the water body. Some water bodies, especially like close to the Rockies, are so clear that our reel, which goes up to 20 meters, can't even go um, far down enough until you can't see the, um, the disc anymore. So this is really dependent on the water body that you're testing and also the time of the year. So once you have all of this data, you wanna make sure everything's written down so you'll remember it and you can enter it later. Um, and you wanna pack up everything um, back into your kit or give it back to uh, your teacher so it can be packed up properly. Um, that's it for the demo. I don't know if there's any quick questions. Any quick questions? I just wondered if you could share with them the, the when Water Rangers was founded and by whom and now, you know, how successful it's been in the world. Yeah, sure. Um, so Water Rangers was founded in 2015 by Kat Kavanaugh. She's our executive director now. Um, and it really stemmed from her father being part of a lake association. So a group of residents around a lake that were really concerned about it. And they would get lab tests for their water body, which is great, but they're pretty expensive to do lab tests. And you have to wait a few weeks for the results. Um, and so that's what they would do. They would go only once a summer because that's all the Lake Association could afford. They would send a sample off to the lab and they would only get the results a few weeks later. And then it would be put in a report at the end of the summer um, to share with all of the residents. But it was so scientific um, that nobody really knew what it meant. And they couldn't do anything to the water body by then if there had been any issues because they only found out about it a few months later. So she wanted to have a way for people to be able to share this data really easily and also in real time. So right away when they took the data so that people could act if there was anything wrong with a water body. So that's why we have the combination of the data platform and also the kits that are super easy to use. As you saw in like 15 minutes, um, I was able to teach you everything that's in there. And when you use them, you'll see after once or twice, you'll become a water tester expert as well. They are quite easy to use. And now we're used by 180 groups in 20 countries around the world, mostly in Canada and the US and also expanding in the UK um, right now. And we have employees pretty much all over Canada um, working with water rangers. Yeah, I have one last question. How did Kat get her start? What was the contest she participated in? Uh, yeah, it was a contest called uh, Aqua Hacking. So um, it was for, I think it was for the Ottawa region. Um, so this is a competition where people have to solve problems for water bodies. It's still happening. They do it every year, but for different regions uh, of Canada. So you can Google aqua hacking and um, their associated organization is called uh, Aqua Action. Uh, they do a lot of great work. And so they actually won the first prize 
um, and that gave her some seed money to be able to start Water Rangers. Great story, great story. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, guys. Uh, Have fun water testing.